Breaking into the screen industries is an exciting career dream for many, but one that can be a real challenge to achieve. There are many factors which exclude a range of people from accessing and progressing in this industry, such as not having the right education, access to networks, or the means to accept low paid entry level roles. This means there is a lack of diversity in the sector with a lot of people missing out on their dream career. Our collective culture suffers as the shows that are made are not often produced by talent who reflects the UK's population. To combat this lack of diversity, organisations have, over the years, developed interventions, generally referred to as diversity schemes. But hang on, these schemes have been around for ages. Why haven't they fixed the problem already? Well, it's been argued that they don't address the barriers to access and progression in the industry, so schemes aren't able to make a long-lasting impact. What has been missing from this debate, however, is some robust evidence based on the experiences of diversity scheme participants. In order to address that, researchers from the Screen Industries Growth Network undertook some research on the impact of diversity schemes on career progression. It was important to us that we heard from the people who took part in the schemes to understand how the interventions impacted them. This new research fills a gap in evidence on those experiences and importantly, we've been able to assess the effectiveness of these schemes. So, what did the research discover? First of all, participants often found the schemes to be really rewarding. Let's see what participants found valuable in the schemes and how they felt that these activities helped their careers. First of all, the course was free. It was really crucial as I couldn't afford the available training otherwise. And I suffered great. During the scheme, they'd offer to help with our CVs, or if we were applying for a job, they'd run practice interviews and things like that. So they just weren't based on trying to get us into the industry. They also tried to help us better us as people as well. It was really strange being exposed to those kinds of worlds. I mean, we didn't even know that those career paths existed, that these people existed, these companies existed. They really did try to diversify it. They were really interested in showing us that it wasn't just about writing and directing and acting, that there were lots of other routes into it. I did get to do a, I think it was an NFTS course, so like a film course, so it's how to use the camera, how to shoot and stuff. The scheme was advertising it and that was something that I got to do through them. Then that probably helped in my current job as well and they arranged all of that, so that was really good. We were all assigned a mentor. My mentor, I still talk to him now. It was only meant to be a six months mentorship, but he helped me. After I did my internship with his company, he helped get me on their books as an actual freelancer. He got me six weeks of work paid. He really helped with advice and stuff and gave me CV tips. We still chat now. Networking was a big plus from the schemes. I think one of the biggest issues for me personally is a lack of a network and a lack of access. Sometimes it feels like there's a wall and you just need one person to welcome you through the wall and then you're on the inside. So I think the building of these networks has been really, really valuable for me and this is something that I need to continue to do. And um, the experience of it has been great. I did get a placement on a three-day film set, which was probably the most useful thing for me because I was actually able to get onto a set and see how it worked, and that was really useful. And what I got from it was that practical experience. And the scheme essentially paid for my first month's wage, and then I carried on working with them. I was there for 10 months, I think. We've seen the value that participants felt they got from taking part in these schemes. Industry knowledge, networking, 
and practical skills and experience were really important to them in starting or progressing in the industry. This information is missing from previous research, so we were pleased that we were able to provide this detail. That's right, and on top of what Anna just said, some of the schemes did well to engender a culture of support and nurturing that has the potential to make working in the industry more appealing. This is something that could be strengthened as schemes are repeated with new regional networks of alumni sharing good practice. Yes, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes in terms of shifting the cultures of work in the screen industries. Encouraged by the support offered by the schemes, many participants were left excited about what the future might hold for them in the screen industries. However, for most, the sobering reality of work in this highly competitive and unequal sector has meant that their work towards a career in TV and film has been compromised by practical and cultural barriers. I've worked on shows where I felt like the odd one out. I've worked on a show, it was filmed up here, but all the crew came from down south and they were all private school crew. And it was weird because they didn't understand my accent for a start. I've sat in round table situations where one, I've been the only person who talks like I talk. Two, I've been the only older female. And three, I've been the only person who's not really middle class. I mean, there's like a massive mismatch. And I think it reflects a lot in the content that's being produced. There are quite a lot of gaps in my CV. There were sometimes months at a time where I'll be scrambling with work. I feel like the work can be quite seasonal and it makes me worry about the next couple of months because I'm struggling already. It can be quite stressful, the whole constant searching for work. Yeah. So I come from a working class background, so the money situation, as much as I'd love not to think about it, it's a very real situation. I tried to get in the industry for about a year, I want to say, but it just wasn't sustainable. The biggest part was that I was trying to make it my livelihood, and in order to make it a livelihood, you have to be earning money, and if you're not earning money, then you can't live. And I tried to be optimistic about it, but you just can't. And then there's a public transport situation. The thing is, there's only so many buses here that can get to certain places, and there's certain places where I can't even get a bus to. Or if I do, it's just one. And sometimes it doesn't even turn up. And I have no other options as I don't drive. I'm already getting worried about what I'm gonna do because I'm probably gonna have to get a car. In the runner role with locations, they're very keen on you having your own car, but how am I gonna be able to afford a car? It feels like yet another barrier. Every producer I talk to, it feels like everybody on the outside is putting on a front and they're like, oh, we're doing so well. And then you go for a coffee with them and they're like, um, oh, I can't afford to pay my bills. I feel like I'm gonna burn out very soon. I think our business has got a real problem with that. I think in terms of how people sustain themselves, particularly when you're a woman, yeah. I think our business is not open to people who've got other responsibilities. As other research has also indicated, much of the good work done by schemes comes up against the reality of an industry which is yet to fully adapt. An industry which still excludes people if they don't have the money to support themselves, don't know the right people, or aren't able to commit the time demanded of them by production. Even when that's due to factors such as caring responsibilities and underlying health conditions. It seems that without further targeted work on policy changes, it, it will be hard to break down the barriers further. Yes, and that work we mentioned earlier on changing cultures to be more inclusive and supportive has yet to filter through to working conditions. Having explored the positives of the schemes but seen the challenges faced by participants, what does it take to have some success in the screen industries? Having taken into account the benefits of these schemes and the challenges that limit their impact, we've explored examples of participants doing particularly well following their involvement. 
These success stories highlight where schemes have helped people to get a foothold and make progress in the screen industries. However, these success stories also illustrate what else might be needed for schemes to bolster their impact. I had a really great time on the scheme, but I found that afterwards it was hard to work as a freelancer because of the financial instability and work-life balance. You see, I have a disability that means long days are really hard for me. But luckily, this employed role came up, which was basically office hours. It was also really near my family home, which meant I didn't need to worry about relocating or spending loads on commuting. Since Becca's participation in the diversity scheme ended, having employed status and living close to work has become essential. It's been quite tough getting into the industry after the scheme and uni, but I've been really lucky that some friends from uni were able to recommend me for a couple of films and some TV. What's really helped is that I've been able to use a family car to get around. And my parents helped me move down south to be closer to the big film studios. While the scheme Adriana took part in was important to set her on her career path, the network she developed at uni, as well as the financial support from her family, have been vital in allowing her to pursue this work. I've always felt a bit uneasy about using diversity schemes to build my career but I understand that my background prevents me from accessing certain opportunities. Whilst one scheme hasn't really provided me enough support, through the use of multiple schemes, I was then able to start making good progress in starting my career and eventually securing the one year trainee post that I'm on now, which is great. This is a practice the researchers termed scheme hopping. Considering the challenges set out earlier, the practice of scheme hopping is helpful and even necessary as participants try to build their careers. Nonetheless, this raises the question, if people are taking advantage of multiple schemes and other sources of help, such as bursaries, are they crowding out other people? This research has provided a more thorough understanding of the experiences and impacts of recent diversity schemes in the Yorkshire and Humber region. As this film has shown, while it's clear that schemes are really valuable to participants, there remains a range of barriers to access and progression. This limits the scheme's impact unless other enabling factors are in place. Here's Anna and Ben again to give their final thoughts on the research. So to change the, the makeup and the culture of the industry, we need concentrated efforts from organisations, whether it's through the schemes that we study here or from more fundamental changes to policy and practice. That's right. And where schemes are offered, our findings can be useful. In the full report, we've detailed the ups and downs of participating in diversity schemes and made a number of recommendations for organisers, funders and indeed participants on how to get the most out of these schemes for the future. Despite the barriers and the need to get your foot in the door and advance in the industry, for many the schemes provided really positive outcomes. We see diversity schemes as part of the solution, however top-down changes are needed. Yet for schemes to thrive and regional alumni networks to form, continued and targeted funding is essential. A critical mass of people who have been through these schemes is needed to pave the way for a more equitable industry in the future.